유대인들은 예수님을 메시아로 인정하지 않지요. 또 그러면서 그들은 메시아를 기다리고 있습니다. 그들이 기다리는 메시아는 과연 누구일까요? 그리고 또 우리가 믿고 있는 예수님과 유대인들이 기다리는 메시아는 어떤 차이가 있을까요? 바로 이런 부분에 대해서 자세하게 소개하는 책이 있습니다. 바로 누가 메시아인가 라는 책입니다. 이 책을 쓰신 분이 영국의 토니 피어스 목사님이신데요. 이분은 영국에서 오랫동안 유대인 선교를 하시면서 또 성경의 예언에 따른 현재의 여러 가지 상황을 설명해주는 마지막 때를 비추는 빛이라는 매가진을 또 발행하고 있는 분이시기도 합니다. 저는 토니 피어스 목사님의 누가 메시아인가 이 책을 읽으면서 아, 이 유대인들이 메시아에 대해서 이렇게 생각하는구나 많은 정보와 또 깨달음을 얻을 수 있었고요. 저는 오늘 이 책을 쓰신 토니 피어스 목사님을 만나서 이 책에 대한 내용을 좀더 자세하게 들어보기 위해서 영국 런던으로 찾아왔고 또제 앞에는 토니 피어스 목사님이 앉아 계십니다. 목사님 이렇게 귀한 시간 내주셔서 고맙습니다. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. God bless you. 먼저 누가 메시아인가 이 책을 쓰시게 된 동기는 어떤 겁니까? Well, I've always been interested in Jewish people right, since I became a Christian. Um, I worked for three years at an Orthodox Jewish school teaching French and German, and I was uh, preaching the gospel also in London. And we came across many Jewish people who we talked to about Jesus. And I was uh, sad to find how many of them know nothing about Jesus or are very much against Jesus or have a wrong idea of Jesus. And so I wanted to present the truth about Jesus to the Jewish people. help them to understand that he is their messiah and that he loves them and he wants to do good to them not harm. 목사님께서 사역하고 계신 그 지역이 런던에서도 골드스크린이라는 지역인데 그 지역에는 제가 알기로도 유대인들이 많이 살고 있더라고요. 영국이라는 나라에 유대인들이 어느 정도 있고 또 현재 영국에서 유대인들의 어떤 사회적 위치 어느 정도입니까? Yeah, Goldstrain is one of the main Jewish areas in London. It's quite what we call an Orthodox Jewish area. There are actually four synagogues in the same street as this church where we meet here in Bridge Lane. Um, I'm not sure the exact popul- Jewish population of Gold is Green. I know that in London there's about 200,000 Jewish people, so probably about 30 to 40,000 live in Gold is Green. Hendon, the next borough, is also very Jewish. So the whole area here is, is really the center of Uh, Jewish life in in the United Kingdom, and we have uh, opportunities to share the gospel with Jewish people as we go out and preach the gospel and tell them about Jesus. Sometimes we go to their meetings, and sometimes they come to our meetings, and we try to share with them the news about Jesus Christ as Yeshua Hamashiach, as we call him in Hebrew. 우리가 알고 있는 기독교에서의 메시아와 유대인들이 생각하는 메시아하고는 약간 좀 차이가 있다고 그러더라고요. 우리는 메시아를 하나님의 아들, 하나님과 동급인 어떤 그 신적인 존재로 생각하는데 유대인들이 생각하는 메시아는 신적인 존재가 아니라 사람이어야 된다 이렇게 이야기를 한다면서요. Yeah, I mean the interesting thing about Judaism and Christianity is that we both believe that the Tanakh, the Old Testament, is the word of God. But we have a different interpretation of the scriptures in the, in the Bible. And we believe that uh, the prophecies in the Bible speak of a Messiah who will come as suffering servant, as according to Isaiah 53, who will be uh, Emmanuel, God with us, and who will be the Son of God, uh, as prophesied in the scriptures. Now, when you come to the Jewish idea of the Messiah, um, basically there are many, actually, One has to say that Jewish people have several ideas about the Messiah. Um, there are some liberal Jews who think that the Messiah is, uh, the prophecies of the Messiah will be fulfilled in what we call a messianic age. So all the people will come into a better world and there'll be peace and love and justice and uh, there'll be a change of consciousness. It's almost, as one Jewish man said to me, the Messiah is a state of mind, not a person. So that's one approach which some Jewish people have to the Messiah. Uh, the orthodox idea is that the Messiah is a man, a person who's going to come. Uh, he'll be a great man to uh, solve the problems of the world. Actually, I did have, I'll just read a quote from the rabbi on the Messiah, which I put in this book here. 
says the Jewish concept of the Messiah, that which is clearly developed by the prophecies of the Bible, he's the leader of the Jewish people, strong in wisdom, power, and spirit. It is he who will bring complete redemption to the Jewish people, both spiritually and physically. Along with this, he'll bring eternal peace, love, prosperity, and moral perfection to the entire world. The Jewish Messiah is truly human in origin. He is born of ordinary human parents and is of the flesh and blood like all mortals. So the concept there is that the Messiah is a great man who's going to come and to change the consciousness and the thinking of people, cause them to live in peace and justice with one another. And uh, he is a man who's born as you and I are born of mortal flesh, born of normal human parents. Um, and it uh, rules out the concept that we have in the Bible of the virgin birth of Jesus and the supernatural birth of Jesus. So they, they don't believe that. Um, according to a man called Maimonides, also known as Rambam, who gives what I've found to be the usual orthodox concept of the Messiah, he says that when the Messiah comes, he will do three main tasks. He will bring the Jewish people back to Israel, he will rebuild the temple, and he will create peace in all the world and the knowledge of God throughout the earth. So uh, that's basically uh, based on Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 11, where it speaks about the word of the Lord going out into all the nations and they uh, beat swords into plowshares and uh, don't study war anymore. And uh, the idea of the, the temple being rebuilt, which you find in Ezekiel chapters 40 through to 48, and the presence of the Lord being there and the nations turning to God. Now, I was talking to an Orthodox Jew the other day, actually, on this subject, and I said, you have to have a lot of faith to believe that. You've got to believe that an ordinary man is going to come. He's going to bring the Jew he's going to, has to bring the Jews back to the Torah, by the way. That's another important thing I should have said. One of the things which the Messiah has to do is to bring the Jewish people back to uh, walking in the ways of the Torah, so they'll all be observant of the commands in the Torah, uh, and they will study the Torah and obey the teachings of Moses, Moshe, Rabbeinu, as they call him, Moses, our teacher. And <clears throat> as a result of that, the Jews will come back to God. And also, basically, all the nations have to come to God. Now, in Judaism, actually, they don't say that uh, everybody has to convert to Judaism. But the Jewish idea is that we should all be faithful to our religion, whatever it is. So if you're born Muslim, be a good Muslim. If you're born Christian, be a good Christian. If you're born Jewish, be a good Jew. Um, as I was talking to this Orthodox Jew, I said, you have to have a lot of faith to believe this, because not only are you going to bring the Jews back to, to God, you also have to bring the Muslims back to your idea of God, and the Christians, everybody else, and then they're going to live in peace with one another. Uh, they're also going to have to rebuild the temple, which is not very popular amongst the Muslims, amongst the Arabs, so they're going to have to change their mind towards the Jewish people, and towards this whole idea. And then I said, you believe he's a man, yes? So he said, yes, he's a man. So I said, he's going to die. So I said, what happens after he dies? How does he maintain this new way of life? He said, well, it'll have set up a system and people will walk in it and they'll live in this way. So I said, well, the problem with the human race is that we have systems like the Torah and we all fall away from it. We need someone who is to an eternal person to bring us back to God, to bring us to walk in his ways. And of course, in the New Testament, we see that Yeshua... Jesus is revealed as an eternal person, prophesied in Isaiah that he'd be born to a virgin by supernatural birth, by the Holy Spirit coming upon uh, the virgin, and he would be Emmanuel, God with us. And the Hebrew term Emmanuel means literally that. It means God with us. Uh, and of course, we have other scriptures in the Hebrew Bible which point to the Messiah being a, a divine person. Um, including many of the prophecies which Jewish people believe are about the Messiah. So the prophecy of, for example, of Isaiah um, chapter 2 does imply that the one whose word goes out is the Lord, that he's not just a, a great man, he is Yahweh, Jehovah. In Zechariah chapter 14, where it says that the Lord will come and stand on the Mount of Olives, and then the kingdom will become the Lord's, and the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day, which is another prophecy which they say is going to, to speak of the Messiah having an eternal kingdom. It uses there the words for God, which are only the words which are only applied to God, Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim. So 
In fact, if, the, if they look into their scriptures, they'll find that the scriptures do actually point to the Messiah being a divine person. And that, of course, ties in with what we believe in, in the New Testament. Um, of course, there is a major problem from the Jewish theological view. From the Jewish point of view of theology, um, God is one, and they say he is one who can't be divided. He can't be three. He can't be three in one. And therefore, God cannot become a man and dwell amongst us. So this is a major problem for Jewish theology. It's uh, something which I've actually done a chapter on in this book, which shows how there is a Jewish response to this uh, question. But um, just briefly, the very first verse of the Bible, in Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim vet Aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is a masculine plural word. Bara, the verb, is a singular. So you have a plural and a singular. And in Genesis chapter 1, God says, Let us make man in our image. So God speaks in the plural there. And the question is, who is God talking to? Rabbis say he's talking to the angels. But that doesn't really work out because the angels aren't. We're not made in the image of angels. We're made in the image of God. And so there is a, a concept right through the scriptures of God being a plural unity, which, of course, is manifested in the person of Jesus, the Messiah, who is Emmanuel, God with us. And the New Testament makes very clear that Jesus was born supernaturally to a virgin and had the nature of God and is therefore able to do uh, the things which the Bible speaks of. So those are some of the issues which we often talk to Jewish people about. 그러니까 결국 이제 유대인들이 기다리는 메시아는 사람으로 오는데 또그 목사님께서 쓰신 누가 메시아인가 그 책에 보면은 우리는 한 메시아가 초림과 재림 이렇게 두번 오시는 걸로 우리는 알고 있지만 유대교에서는 하나의 메시아가 이렇게 두번 오는 게 아니라 두 명의 메시아가 따로따로 온다 이런 이야기를 쓰셨어요. 그 얘기를 좀 해주시죠. Yes, I should say that not every Jewish person believes in the idea that there are two messiahs, but there is one interpretation within Judaism that uh, there is what they call Mashiach ben Yosef, which means Messiah, son of Joseph, and Mashiach ben David, Messiah, son of David. Mashiach ben Do Joseph suffers and dies, and the Mashiach ben David rules as David ruled. So the Joseph one, he's like Joseph in Genesis, who went down into Egypt and was humiliated and then raised up as a king. The idea behind this is if you study the scriptures, you may know that um, in, for example, in the book of Isaiah, you have two different portraits of the Messiah. So in Isaiah chapter 2, it says, um, concerning the days of the Messiah, many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So there's a picture of the Messiah uh, reigning as a king from Jerusalem, which you also have in Jeremiah and Zechariah and Ezekiel, uh, from a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, his word going out into the nations, as a result of his reign, the nations beat swords into plowshares. So in other words, they stop making war and start making peace. So they live in peace together. And this, in this case, the Messiah is actually raised up and honored. Uh, so he's in a position of power. When you come to Isaiah 53, we have a different picture of one who would be, who is described as a servant of the Lord. Uh, and in Isaiah 53, verse 3, it says, He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. For we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here we have one who is going to be despised and rejected, be a man of sorrows, be acquainted with grief. Uh, he would bear the sins of others. He will bear 
their iniquities, it says. He will, uh, for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. And it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So this is a suffering Messiah. And one interpretation of Judaism is that this is a picture of the Messiah, who they call Mashiach ben Yosef, the suffering Messiah, who suffers as Joseph suffered, is humiliated, and then is raised up. Uh, one idea which I've read in some rabbinic writings is that uh, the first, the suffering Messiah, comes during the War of Gog and Magog, which you have in Ezekiel 38 and 39, when the nations come against Israel. He is slain in that war. Then the second Messiah comes along and raises him up from the dead. And he, the second Messiah is Mashiach ben David, Messiah, son of David. Um, so this, these are different views which rabbis have put forward. I'm not saying that every Jewish person believes that, but that those are some explanations they try to have for the fact that there is a very different picture, which you have in Isaiah chapter 2, of Messiah from the one you have in Isaiah 53. One raised up and exalted, the other humiliated and put to death, dying for the sins of the world, according to our scripture. Uh, from the Christian point of view, the explanation is that Jesus came the first time, to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53, to be the suffering servant, to be the one upon whom the Lord would lay the iniquity of us all through his crucifixion, would rise from the dead, and would then ascend to heaven and send the Holy Spirit into the world so the disciples of Jesus should preach the gospel, take this message to the ends of the earth. And at the end of the days when Jesus returns, he will come back to judge the world in righteousness and will then set up the messianic kingdom according to Isaiah chapter 2, which will reign over the nations. Now, as I say, that's the Christian interpretation. From the Jewish interpretation, they have a number of different ways of trying to get around this problem, I have to say. One is to say there are two messiahs, both of whom are great men, neither of whom are God, but both of whom suffer, one, one of whom suffers, and the other one who reigns as King David reigned. Now, Having said that, many Jewish people actually ignore Isaiah 53 altogether as being in the prophecy of Messiah. Um, some would say that Isaiah 53 is actually about Israel suffering, and Israel is the suffering servant of Jehovah. Israel suffers, is rejected, uh, and Israel somehow through their suffering is atoning for the sins of the nations, uh, which is the interpretation which... Uh, Jewish rabbi called Rashi actually put forward on this subject. Uh, so they interpret Isaiah 53 as about Israel suffering on behalf of the nations, um, which really doesn't work actually, because if that is the case, then you have to believe that Israel is able somehow to bear the sins of the, the Gentiles. And Isaiah actually writes, for the sin of my people, he was stricken. So if Israel is, he is, is the Messiah, or is the servant of the Lord, and he's suffering for the sin of my people, Isaiah's people, then Isaiah must be a Gentile. So Isaiah can't be a Gentile, he has to be a Jewish prophet. Uh, also, Isaiah has spent most of the, the book telling us about the sins of Israel. So how can one who is a sinner bear the sins of others? Uh, it doesn't really work. It only wo And clearly this passage is not talking about a whole nation, it's talking about an individual person. It gives you details of his suffering. It says that he will uh, be afflicted, he'll be led as a lamb to the slaughter, he will come before a trial in which he will not open his mouth, uh, he'll be cut off from the land of the living, so he'll be put to death, and he will uh, be made a grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he'd done no violence. Uh, now all of those details actually are fulfilled in Jesus. Um, he was taken from prison and judgment. He, he stood before Pontius Pilate. He didn't uh, defend himself. He was then uh, put to death by crucifixion. And it's interesting, it says, they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death. Um, the Messiah, when people who were crucified should actually have been put, uh, either were left on the cross as a warning to others not to follow their ways, or were just thrown into a pit, the Valley of Hinnom, outside Jerusalem. If that had happened to Jesus, then what would have happened to the resurrection? But in fact, a, a rich man called Joseph of Arimathea intervened, 
took him down from the cross, asked Pontius Pilate if he could have the body of Jesus, took him down from the cross, put him in his own sealed tomb, and we know what happened on the third day. Jesus rose from the dead to fulfill the scripture. And uh, it says in Isaiah that the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied, which means he has to rise from the dead so he can see uh, the results of his work and ascend to heaven uh, from where he will return. So the literal interpretation of Isaiah 53 has to point to a person, not to a nation. It has to point to one who has already come, to Jesus, who has already fulfilled this scripture. And Isaiah chapter 2 speaks about the second coming of Jesus uh, at the end of days, which uh, will come after the time when Israel is gathered to the nations and there is a final conflict over Jerusalem. And then it says in Zechariah that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and he will be king over all the earth in that day. And this is one of the subjects which I try and uh, explain in the book. And uh, make. Uh, and I think a lot of Christians actually are helped by understanding that because some Christians don't really have difficulty seeing how all the messianic prophecies fit in. I have to say also that one of the Jewish objections to Jesus is that um, if they have their idea that the Messiah has to come and bring peace to the world and bring the knowledge of God to the world, they say, well, since Jesus came, we've had 2,000 years of wars and troubles. Uh, the temple was destroyed. The Jews went into exile. Uh, so the opposite of what we say the Messiah should have done has, has taken place. Uh, now, we say that those things are going to happen when Jesus returns, that he will gather all the Jewish people who are saved back into Israel, he will rebuild the temple, and he will make peace in the, in the world. So it's yet to come. So it's actually important for both Jews and Christians to understand the, uh, the concept of two messiahs coming once or one messiah coming twice. And when we come to the New Testament, it's clear that Jesus anticipated that he would go away, he would depart, and he would come back again. Uh, and he, when he comes back again, he won't come back this time as a suffering servant. He will come back this time as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords with all the power of God available to him. So this is uh, one of the, you know, if we can get Jewish people to talk about these subjects, it's one of the things we like to share with them, to show them how the Messiah has come and is coming again. And is both of these prophecies are fulfilled in one person, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. 그러면 유대인들이 기다리는 메시아하고 우리 기독교에서 얘기하는 마지막 때 나타나게 될 적그리스도하고 어떤 관련이 있을까요? I mean, some Christians say, well, if a great man arrives, makes peace in the world, um, allows the Jews to rebuild the temple, will they think that he's the Messiah, and will that be the Antichrist? I would be uh, open to that as a possibility, but not. The question then is, is the Antichrist a Jew or a Gentile? I think there are implications in the scriptures to me that he is a, a Gentile, not Jewish. We are living, I believe, in the last days and that Jesus is coming again. And we see the signs of his return in the events taking place in the Middle East. And there are Jewish people who are also seeing the connection between the rebirth of Israel uh, in our time and the prophecies of the coming. Of the, of the Messiah and the looking for Messiah to come.